What happened in the 20th century? Toward a critique of extremist reason. Human civilizations have occasionally been characterized as the outcomes of a permanent struggle between remembering and forgetting. If one takes such an image as a basis, positive cultural content and features would be like reefs rising out of the sea of forgetting, due to the sedimenting labor of repetition, tradition and archiving. Should the sea currents change, these emergent reefs can become increasingly inundated, and traditional subjects, which only a short while ago were still considered to be up to date and contemporary, sink beneath the waterline. In the following reflections I proceed on the assumption, or better, from the observation that as far as the Western Hemisphere is concerned, something like a reversal of the currents has taken place in contemporary culture. As a result, the balance of memory with regard to the recent past has dramatically shifted in the last few years. Hence, in the first place, I would like to refer to the synergies of triumphant consumerism with its imagery of the beautiful life, and how this is further developed by neoliberal doctrines, which leads to the jettisoning of the greater part of our dark and disturbing memories. Secondly, we have more than one reason to assess the collapse of leftist traditions, a collapse that has given rise to the fear that they could sink forever into the capitalist leth, before we even have the opportunity to map the sinking reef systems, which are to a large extent already submerged. Such fear is a symptom of conservative anxiety, not the commitment to a political standpoint. You can glean the extent to which these reflections are justified from a remark by Alain Badiou, one of the last guardians of a now defunct radicalism at the beginning of the 21st century. In the introduction to his remarkable book, The Century, which appeared in 2005 and obviously speaks not of the century to come, but rather of the one that has just ended, he felt impelled to cite an aphorism by Natasha Michel, which runs, quote, the 20th century has taken place, end quote. This statement would be foolish or trivial if it did not represent the antithesis of another statement that is not explicitly referenced, but is easy enough to figure out. The statement that at bottom the 20th century never took place. With all of its battles and atrocities, it has faded into a mere phantom that can no longer be reconstructed from the present generation's attitude towards life. And it would seem that no other future looms than that of a stock of myths and a desolate disposal site for scenes of violence. Should something of its great motifs remain of significance for later ages, this is only because they will still serve for some time as a repository of materials for popular films with tragic settings. The 20th century's phantomization was carried out behind the backs of today's generation without our being able to point to a single event through which the gravity and passion of the past age was extinguished in us. Neither the disaster of Chernobyl, nor the fall of the Berlin Wall, neither the space station Mir's controlled plunge back into the Earth's atmosphere, nor the sequencing of the human genome, neither the introduction of the Euro, nor the attack on the World Trade Center, no other event from recent times can be identified as the culprit either. The infinitely banal statement, the 20th century has taken place, can best be appreciated by relating it to Hegel's dictum that the life of spirit is not, quote, the life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation, but rather the life that endures it and maintains itself in it, end quote. Elevated to this level, Badiou's thesis immediately leads to an overwhelming logical and human challenge. It requires thinkers to pause beneath the petrifying gaze of the Medusa and contemplate it as an icon of present-day being, a demand which corresponds to the spirit of a century, in which philosophy's basic emotion changed from wonder to horror. To be sure, even ancient wonder was never entirely free of dark emotions, and it must have already cost the ancients a certain amount of effort to adhere to the ontological dogma according to which all that exists is good. 
only as tragic excess could a remark like that of Philoctetes, quote, how can I praise the gods when their ways are so evil, end quote, break through the universal imperative of positivity. However, only in recent modernity, more precisely in the philosophical witches' sabbath from the time between the world wars, and then more fully after 1945 could the thesis that being is anything but good, indeed that the good must be wrested from being, be explicitly stated by making a case for something that is fundamentally constituted, quote-unquote, otherwise than being. To recall Emmanuel Levinas's post-ontological or meta-ontological figure of thought, whose claims reach further than we can explain at the moment, and whose implications may well exceed the discursive capability of a contemporary philosophy. At the beginning of the 19th century, Hegel's sublime sang Freud had been necessary to conceptualise a spirit that had the virtue of looking steadfastly at the sun and at death while engaging in its learning processes. Thinking at the beginning of the 21st century has lost the strength of this elevated indifference. We find ourselves compelled to return to La Rouchefoucauld in making the observation we cannot look squarely at either death or the sun or the 20th century. With this in mind, let us take a closer look at the question that forms the title of this lecture. If the question is, quote, what happened in the 20th century, end quote, then surely a historical account is not expected as an answer. We know from the start that no enumeration of the changes for good or for evil would tell us enough about what constituted the 20th century and its dramatic and evolutionary substance. The difficulties in accounting for the era are rooted in more than just the fact that, in hindsight, the century manifests itself as a Medusian one and extremist one, particularly in the violence unleashed during its first half. The key complications that hinder a reconstruction of the 20th century are connected to the fact that this era, which is dubiously referred to as a quote-unquote age of extremes, was in truth even more an age of complexities. Looked at from our present situation, this way of characterising the era seems to be self-evident. It would remain the most vacuous of all possible statements on the subject if it did not derive a specific historical significance from the fact that the dominant discourses and actions of the epoch were engaged in a furious struggle against the emergence of complexity. The formulation, quote-unquote, reduction of complexity, which has characterised a general aspect of the functioning of social systems since Lumen, has a quite specific meaning for the 20th century. It must be emphasised that the Medusian extremisms of that era all possess the character of fundamentalisms of simplification, including even the fundamentalism of militancy, and the myth of a quote-unquote new beginning through revolution. That bitter and proud attitude of a radical break with the given world. In the meantime, among Europeans, this attitude has lost its radiance. Yet it continues to have a sporadic influence, particularly in the maquis of latter-day leftist radicalism down to the present day. Wherever manifestations of the extreme were encountered in the course of the 20th century, there was always an uprising against complexity. That is, against the formal law of the real as conceived in contemporary terms. To be sure, this uprising was carried out entirely in the name of the real itself, of which all camps had formed extremely reductionist concepts. Because a quasi-formal gigantomachy was embedded in the heart of the 20th century as a duel between the logics of complexity and their polemical simplification, we must not be surprised when this age strikes us in retrospect as a century of confusion, as a time devoid of an overview, and an era in which contingent standpoints were exaggerated. In this case, the main form of exaggeration consisted in the reduction of all things to an all-powerful ground or underlying factor, an observation already noted by the critic Carl Christian Bry in 1924 in his forgotten masterpiece, 
the Capta Religionen, translated religions in disguise, without causing the followers of reductionist extremist religions to question their beliefs. The quote-unquote age of extremes, suggested by Eric Hobsbawm, has never remained silent about itself. As an age of total chatter, it has already said everything there is to say about itself, and the opposite of that too. And even this observation was made long ago, as one can gather from Carl Jasper's text on man in the modern age, for instance, where analogous statements can be found passim. What the author describes in this book as the phenomenon of, quote, the struggle with no fighting front, end quote, was able to recur a half century later in the case of leftists suffering from disappointed or delayed complexity under the heading of a quote unquote new obscurity. The only difference being that the source is no longer recognised. It would hence be a difficult, if not futile, undertaking, and would furthermore condemn us to a methodologically false approach. If we wanted to learn to what was said and written about the epoch, in order to learn what kind of a century we are dealing with, we would come face to face with the darkest of all hyperboles, as formulated from the standpoint of the murdered Jews, the exemplary victims of the century-long madness, viz. the definition of the 20th century as the era of the great breakdown of civilization, symbolized by names such as Auschwitz and Treblinka. Even if the whole truth about the Shoah were empirically brought to light and the sources of the extermination were fully grasped, one would presumably understand only a small segment of the 20th century's global drama. Even less would be achieved if one wished to add that a supposedly quote-unquote short 20th century reached from 1917 to 1991 and thus ran parallel with the history of the Soviet experiment. Its core process could have consisted in nothing other than the titanic clash between liberalism and egalitarianism, in which the latter manifested itself as a two-headed monster, with a fascist and communist one. Hobsbawm's theses can be read as an echo of another interpretation of the 20th century, proposed by Ernst Nolte and modified by Dan Diner, according to which the century was shaped by its main conflict, the so-called Weltbürgerkrieg. The same author gives the lie to the title of his all-too-successful book when he explains in its crucial chapter why it was not so much the clamorous drama of the struggle between ideologies that decided the epoch's outcome, but rather the quiet upheaval of all traditions that was triggered by the decline of the agrarian culture and the triumph of urbanisation. However that may be, this suggestion sheds lights on the situation in present where in a highly industrialised country such as the Federal Republic of Germany, only 2% of the population lives on and from farms, while even in a supposedly agrocentric nation such as France, the corresponding numbers no longer exceed 3-4%. to 4%. If one looks back at the remaining overarching interpretations that were proposed either during the course of the 20th century, or in retrospect, it remains puzzling that in every case particular events, motifs or features have been elevated into epochal images. No contemporary of the early 21st century can imagine themselves circa 1950 without feeling strange, a time when the term quote-unquote atomic age was uttered with a pronounced tremolo informed by a history of philosophy, convinced as they were that the essence of the epoch was finally in sight. One spoke in those days about the atom and fission with the same uneasy piety, indeed with the same ontological lasciviousness with which one began to speak about the genome and its manipulation about the year 2000. Likewise, Arnold Galen's suggestion around the middle of the century that the present age was to be understood as the era of crystallisation is today remembered by only a few experts although it was a brilliant insight that articulated transformation of present social circumstances into the forms they would have in a pacified post-revolutionary condition. Even such an eye-catching title as, quote-unquote, sexual revolution, is largely faded from sight today. More precisely, it has fallen victim to anniversary culture, 
as one could see from the journalistic campaigns for the 50th anniversary of the appearance of the Kinsey Report. Now, the current slogan of the senior citizen revolution is likely to suffer a similar fate. Only a few experts on the third world still remember what the quote-unquote age of decolonization involved. For historically minded political theorists, the 20th century may signify the era of the translatio imperii from the British to the Americans, in which the British retreat from their engagements in the Balkans and the Middle East in February 1947 can be considered a key date, while Europeans tend to have their 20th century limited to the span from August 1914 to May 1st, 2004. In other words, to the complete cycle of Europe's fracturing and the restoration of its integrity. This view, based on historical events, might have a dramaturgical plausibility going for it. In any case, it results in Europeans looking back to the lost century, summer Samarum, without knowing for sure whether, having experienced their own self-destruction, they have now found a more adequate conception of themselves and their role in the world. To say a word in conclusion about so-called globalisation, which monopolised all discourse about the present age at the close of the 20th century. This term, insofar as it is used sensibly, is a synonym for the consolidation of the world into a great artificial system, which distances itself with increasing speed from 20th century problems that now already seem to be mere phantoms. We will have occasion to consider whether the current forgetting of the 20th century does not lead to the fulfilment of the innermost intentions of that century itself.